Hello and welcome to another episode of In Conversation with. In Conversation with is a part part of the Kasi New York Knowledge Series, where we reach out to senior management practitioners and try to gauge the tactical approach, the strategical approach on the theme of sustainability. What happens is we are looking out for executable advice. and the senior management practitioners who have been there who have done that they are able to guide us on the fallacies on the issues on what to do and particularly what not to do so today we have a very very dear friend and a very interesting person uh, mr patrick patrick welcome to the show thank you very much so uh, before uh, you know we move on to our presentation uh, patrick i have a few general questions um, you know a few candid questions um okay. so uh, tell me you you are a european right yes i am still okay so <laughs> how how does a european manage to fall in love with china and manage to stay there for so long um yeah that's um that's a good question but i i i don't have a good answer for it i i, I guess i guess a big reason is that although i am a, a swedish a citizen i have never lived in sweden uh-huh. um so so i've been a foreigner my my whole life um of course when i was growing up it was not in china it was in uh denmark the uk the us so i saw mm-hmm. different cultures and but i was always an outsider uh, mm-hmm. never got really fully integrated and at the same time i was also not swedish either so um i'm basically i don't really fit in anywhere and in china a lot of people complain about never getting integrated into the culture uh, as foreigners foreigners complain about that that it's difficult to um for me that's fine <laughs> so i guess i'm very comfortable in that that i'm i'm a foreigner okay. because that's or, what i've um, been my whole life it, uh, you know or is it that um, you did not first fall in love with china uh, you fell in love with a chinese uh and then you fell in love with china um that's i mean that happened later on i, I was in china for for three or four years quite a long time before i actually uh met my wife and got married so i think uh the, the china relationship was already there uh prior to that i think so but it was so it, it was very random the reason i went there the first time was a lot of people have studied about china before i i came to china the first time and was completely clueless i couldn't use chopsticks i couldn't say even hello or anything so i just fell into it and then just felt that it's very fascinating i think asia is i mean india china all the asian countries have have this much longer history um so everything is I mean I talk about complexity right so the complexity of the culture um is something that you never really have an understanding of and I find that fascinating even after now how many years I'm I'm I don't even want to say how many years it's uh, So tell me uh, one more um, you know pretty personal question before uh, uh, we go on to your presentation um you are an engineer and now you are working on sustainability water oil a um, lot of things within the um, engineering side sustainability side uh, but going back to your childhood uh, when you decided um, you know after your 10th grade or your uh, schooling that you want to go into engineering so are you an engineer by default or are you an engineer by design so default is again just i I I think I I heard you ask that question before sort of so I I get in by default by saying I didn't have enough good grades to get in anywhere else so engineering school was the university which is a very famous university in Denmark and it's a very good university but nobody wants to go there because it's too hard it's very difficult uh people go in and they drop out very quickly um there's no at that time there was no management of the students so people are just left by themselves and and again i loved it <laughs> um, <laughs> i i hated the high school classroom and everything i i loved that thing where you can go and read the books by yourself and then mm-hmm. go to the exam or you can submit your papers and everything so i enjoyed it but i did not have i did not know i was going to enjoy it before i actually came in there 
So, and the same with environmental engineering. Um, it was kind of just like a blind man searching a little bit. Electrical, mechanical, uh, chemical were the others. And I got pushed into building construction engineering um, because again, it's a little bit easier than the others. And then within that environmental engineering, at that time, there was no environmental engineering by itself uh, when I was studying. Now they have uh, their own environmental engineering degree. So it's become much more specialized. And now, unfortunately, I feel it's just like high school. So everyone joins a class and they go through the whole five year period um, with the same kind of group of students. They might take different courses now and then, but they have this kind of core group. So I think you lose something from that. I don't really okay. agree with it. <clears throat> so um, again, a couple of more questions, you know, because um, I, I always have a lot of questions for you. Um, I think it's reciprocal. At our roundtable conferences, uh, you are the person with the maximum questions. Um, you know, so uh, it's only fair that I ask the maximum questions to you. Yeah. Um, sure. In one of your, um, you know, publications, um, you have mentioned um, how consultants desire to conduct community surveys um, is detrimental for many resettlement projects. Yes. Yeah. Now you are a consultant. Um, it is very difficult for consultants to write about their own creed, um, you know, the wrong which we do. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a great article which you have written. Uh, but could you explain in like two, three lines, uh, what do you really mean by that? Well, I, I think you mentioned the ethical question, right? So I, I, love, I love the idea of consulting. Um, I think the idea of consulting that uh, you have some knowledge and then you do that again and again, and then that is valuable for your clients, right? Um, that makes a lot of sense in, in many ways, but then you have the practice of consulting, and I don't like that very much, um, especially in big companies. I, if you look at my profile, you can see that I've joined some larger companies a few times, but it never really works out because I, I like to work on the technical side. And if you join a big company and you're a senior person, they just want you to work on the business development. And then as soon as you win the contract, they just want you to hand it over to someone who doesn't know what they're doing. Uh, and then that junior person tries to survive. And sometimes they do a good job uh, if they're smart. Um, usually something goes wrong. And then the client complains and the senior person goes in and tries to fix it. And that's kind of the business model, which I, <laughs> which I don't like. Um, and in this paper, it was, um, it was related to one project that I, that I came in late and the consultants were just making lots of money by doing surveys. Um, of course, the way I've been working on the project since then, I, um, the consultant makes less money, but it's ethical, it is value for the client, and it is also helping, most importantly, I would say, it's helping the, the villages, the communities, that are being impacted by these projects. So I think that's, that's for me, um, the big issue that uh, if you go in as a consultant and you just make money, but the client is not being protected. And more importantly, the really vulnerable communities are not being protected. I think that's, um, that's really a bad thing. And I'd, I'd no, rather, absolutely. I'd rather be doing something different. <laughs> um, I mean, if, if I just wanted to make money, I'd rather be a management consultant and just do, um, I mean, something that makes no sense. I just do a prediction and this is how you're gonna make money. Um, but for social and environmental work, there are real problems there um, that need need fixing. So that's, uh, and, and I think, I mean, I, I'm a big uh, Nassim Taleb fan and he has a sentence if you see fraud and you don't shout fraud, then you yourself are a fraud. So that is a motto that I'm trying to live by. Um, that uh, yes, I want, to, I want to protect the clients uh, and I also want to have a commercial, <laughs> of course, model for myself to make money, but uh, not at any price. 
Correct, correct. No, no, you are absolutely right. The ethical side of consulting is, uh, you know, disappears in many occasions and uh, you, you are right. The ethical side of consulting is very, very important. Um, it is much more important than making money because uh, finally in uh, environment or climate, uh, it affects the communities that we serve. Um, there is a mega effect on the communities. So if, uh, you know, a one inch uh, diversion in ethics uh, will create a hundred inch uh, diversion in the final result to the community. So, uh, yes, you are absolutely right, sir, on that. Um, let's move to your presentation and then I will have a few more questions for you. Great. I mean, like, like I mentioned, if, if you have any questions when the slide is there, please, please feel free to jump in. You don't have to wait until the end. Because sometimes absolutely. if the slide is there, it can be easier to ask the question and discuss it. Right, so. So is that working? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so um, it's uh, it, it's a little bit. I mean, I'm building on the the topic that I um, presented on the fifth of September on that uh, roundtable. So I have some of the same slides, but I've added more, and because I we have a little bit more time, um, I'm maybe being going to be able to go into more detail to try and. <laughs> Uh, explain um, the points that I have, the ideas that I have, and I and I think I think the way that I'm looking at sustainability is that um, what I believe is the problem is not clearly enough to, uh, defined. So I think to solve the problem, we need to first to define the problem, and if we don't do that in an accurate way, then a lot of the solutions will just be building on something that is inaccurate, and I think that's a uh, that's definitely a problem. So, so here, yeah, I mean, this this is a slide that I use a lot, and um, actually, it used to be, I used to believe because in sort of a caveman world, um, the risks were much more simple, and what has happened is that when we now have financial uh, stock markets, we have industrial facilities. Um, that are very complicated, that we weren't really able to understand the risks of those differences. But now, um, as, as you develop, you get new ideas all the time. Now, I, I think it's a little bit, I think um, what we've actually lost going from the caveman area or the cavewoman era, I should say, uh, at the same time is we've lost our ability to look at complex systems. Because I think back then, living in nature you have to have a lot of knowledge, different plants, different animals, things that can kill you every day. And in the modern world, we don't have that. Um, we, we, a lot of things that can kill you every day is we're kind of protected from. So I, I, I think that, and that's something that I, I, sustainability, we need to have that ability to look at complex systems and natural complex systems, both to understand the problem, but also to develop the, solution so <clears throat> yeah i mean these these are the topics that i presented before so just going around critical to solve not tied so that's something i want to talk about again and go a little bit deeper than i did one month ago the expert problem so this is kind of related to your question about being ethical or not um, I, I think the expert problem is also not only just related to being unethical. Sometimes it's if you're very specialized and the problem is not related to your speciality, um, that also causes uh, issues. Um, the environmental versus social um, versus the financial profits of the business, I think that's this balance that we need to continue to find. And then, of course, how can we? Uh, improve sustainability. Um, so I, before we, uh, I, I, we talked a little bit about water risks. These are just simple examples to show how um, projects that I worked on, issues that um, were missed in the initial project risk assessment. So on this example on the left, um, you have farmers in Sichuan province 
which is where I live in China, um, the traditional way of using groundwater for irrigation is to just dig a very small ditch. And then because the groundwater is very shallow, you just, if you dig uh, to a couple of meters, the water comes out and then you can use it for irrigation. Um, what happened was that when um, these oil and gas companies came in and they were drilling for shale gas, some of that drilling caused maybe some fractures to open up. So they, it was not a pollution issue, but the shallow groundwater simply went down a little bit. So as you can see on that slide, suddenly rather than being a less than two meters, it was maybe four meters. So it doesn't seem like a big uh, impact, but for those farmers, dealing, having to dig an extra two meters where the soil is much harder to dig was a huge impact on their operation. And it was, it shouldn't have been missed in the environmental impact assessment, but it was. Um, on the right side, um, you had this available water, and then you have what the project needed, and then you have the water used by farmers. And it looks like there's a lot of water available. So again, the project says, well, this looks fine. But the issue was that every now and again, there was a water shortage. And that happened maybe on four or five years cycles. And when that happened, then there suddenly wasn't enough water for both the project and the farmers. So if the project hadn't, and they did identify it before there was a water shortage, but it was kind of after the project was already designed. And then they were able to find a solution where they could actually help the farmers during water shortages. So that's the thing where I think um, uh, looking at problems um, in different angles is, is, is very important. So this, this, this slide um, I, I presented before, and what I want to go, because I, I recently got a different thinking about this, because this was, I presented this the first time as in the 70s and the 80s, there was this big transfer of pollution from European countries to countries like China and Eastern Europe. So pollution was moved from these kind of richer developed countries and moved to poorer countries. So poorer countries got the pollution and the richer countries still had their economies grow, but they didn't have the environmental impacts. Um, and now going to this next slide, I'm wondering, and this is, this is kind of an, a question from my side or a concern, because um, I'm not sure that this is actually the issue, but I, I don't see enough evidence um, that is definitely not a problem. So when now we're going to renewable energy, solar, wind farms, electrical cars in Western countries, my concern is because these, these um, industries or these technologies require a lot of metals, a lot of new kinds of different metals. And those metals are being mined in poorer countries. And there's a lot of environmental impacts from that mining. And some of that mining actually is, um, I've, I've seen recent reports saying that it's actually creating more demand for coal power. <laughs> so so if, if one part of the earth is becoming more clean, I mean, that's nice locally, you have clean air, but from a global sustainability point of view, if there's more coal power somewhere else, I mean, the climate change issue is then not being solved. And of course, it's also causing a lot of health impacts in those countries. So I think there needs to be more transparency about that. And if someone is, is using, if countries are using this and corporations are using this uh, in their EST reporting and it's not completely transparent, I think that needs to be improved. Um, so, this is, this is kind of the work I do with the select, um, well, I call it the selective acquisition. Um, so I, I don't work directly with sustainability or ESG, but I work with risk assessments and risk management. And what, what happens is when companies go in and buy, they always, uh, if they find something that is very difficult to resolve, I mean, good risk management is to try and avoid buying it. You don't want to take on the liability. 
Um, so I'm not blaming the companies for doing that. Um, they did not create the problem and they don't want to take over the problem. That's why they're actually paying consultants to go in and identify these risks. Um, and then what happens is it gets moved into the supply chain. So again, I don't see this as a Meshabalian kind of problem. This is not some evil corporation saying we want to hide away the pollution. It's just, um, it's a combination of the initial due diligence, the risk assessment saying, well, we don't want to buy that. And then um, the due diligence process identifies ways of avoiding buying it. And then it goes into the supply chain. <clears throat> Of course, in the supply chain, then you have supply audits, which we have talked about several times. And in this next slide, I want to try and describe what I see. This is again, a theory that I have that so on the left, you have the risk assessment. So then that uh, um, liability or the, the problem from a sustainability point of view gets moved into the supply chain. Then you have the ESG consultants supplier audit. So they identify that problem as a non-compliance. So that puts that supplier under pressure. So what happens with that supplier? If they are not able to solve the problem, then maybe they get dropped out of the supply chain. And then through that process, then you again have a clean line of suppliers, but someone maybe is still needing to fix this, this problem. And it's then in a lower level of supply chain, as you can see on the right side. So this, this is my fear is that the risk assessments and the supplier audits are kind of causing these problems to be more hidden rather than solved. And, and that's why I think it's important that the supply audit and also the EST reporting maybe is done in a different way. Um, that it focuses more on where critical issues might exist rather than just focusing on the suppliers that are nearest to the facility, the manufacturing unit. So basically, the, this is my silent evidence thing that you have this, the green triangle where everything is, is perfect. You have the nice reporting, but the silent evidence is is there something that is supplying um, the green triangle that is actually causing a lot of environmental issues and possibly also social issues? Because these companies are not operating with the right kind of governance. Um, so if, if, if problems are just getting hidden in the top right, and then we have a bottom left that is looking very good, I think then maybe there are better ways to invest our time and money. So this, so this is this is kind of just to, because Apple, I think Apple is a company that gets a lot of, um, has a very good image from a sustainability point of view. So I, I found this on, uh, what is this supplychaindigital.com. Um, so I'm happy to share that link. So this is actually looking at it from an investment point of view. And following Steve Jobs, they talk about how Tim Cook, the CEO, and his expertise as a supply chain specialist was able to, and I've underlined, squeeze its suppliers to ensure the quotes generated are grounded in the truth. So basically what they're doing is um, basically ensuring the proper dip profitability of Apple, but also ensuring the quality of what is being supplied. And that's what the article is focused on because that's what a lot of investors are concerned about. Um, but my, my concern a little bit with this is what are the risks associated with these suppliers being squeezed? Um, so this, this is another um, chart that I found on MarketWatch. So this, this shows um, <clears throat> the profitability or um, the stock price of Apple, but then it sees, uh, shows a lot of the suppliers are not growing in the same way. So, so my question is, yes, is, is this something that is fine? Maybe it's fine. Maybe there's nothing there, 
But I, I think this is a red flag. It's something that should be investigated because if the suppliers are struggling to make money um, and they're getting squeezed on profitability, and they, of course, they have to meet the quality requirements of Apple. Is there a risk that something else has to get dropped? Is sustainability or maybe some of the social issues something that has to be squeezed in order to achieve the results? So I think this is, and looking at these charts is just to give maybe another way that ESG reporting can think about rather than just the simple um, supplier audits. So, so this is just some open questions where I don't have the answers at this time, but what are the goals of these supplier audits? Um, what do they achieve? And how can we improve the audit scope and process? So this is something I'm handing back to Cassie that future roundtable conferences and other people that are wiser than me can think about and provide answers. So Patrick, I have a question here. Um, you know, you're talking about suppliers, you're talking about ESG, um, and we are talking about a uh, trillion dollar company like Apple, uh, you know. So, uh, yeah. but suppliers audit being done, are you um, in some way suggesting that uh, the suppliers who are uh, medium or small scale enterprises usually, uh, they should also be uh, mandatorily uh, filing ESG reports? Is this what you are contemplating? Well, I'm, I mean, I'm not saying it's a requirement for them, but I, from this, this point of view, I think it's, uh, if, if Apple wants them to be sustainable, they have to be, it can't just be based on audits checking them. It has to be because they are profitable, right? So that they are also making enough margin to be sustainable. And and then no, I'm course, not talking about uh, Apple in general. You know, there is another company, one of my favorite companies. Uh, when I talk about sustainability, uh, H&M, the apparel company. Now, um, you know, in their sustainability report, they have claimed that they have 1,600 odd manufacturing facilities, and all the 1,600 are um, ESG compliant. Uh, now, I find that a tad difficult to believe. Uh, because all their manufacturing facilities are in Philippines, Vietnam, China, Bangladesh. Um, you know, so to uh, comply with a simple thing like um, child labor is also very difficult to do across 1600 locations in Vietnam, Philippines and Bangladesh. So, uh, yes, you know, I, I agree to you somewhat um, about, uh, you know, lowering the bar for ESG for uh, uh, small and medium enterprises. Uh, we should ideally lower the bar. Um, and uh, get them to enter into filing ESG or, uh, you know, a semi-ESG. So, um, you know, that, that is the point that I was trying to um, support your uh, description with. Uh, because, um, you know, large companies are able to file an ESG report, uh, but somewhere there is a missing link. Uh, that, that is exactly what you were showing, that there is a missing link. So, uh, you know, that, that is also what I... Uh, uh, ask in my lectures that there might be a missing link, um, you know, even in small things of compliance like child labor, particularly if you have manufacturing locations in Philippines and Bangladesh. I, I completely agree. And, and I, so I, I really like your um, lower bar ESG reporting for the suppliers to give them help from that way. But what I'm also trying to say is H&M and Apple they should have some responsibility for this as well, because Apple says that they help their suppliers um, with their renewable energy and so on. So I, I, I think that what I want to see is that the help is also related to, because if, if they're squeezing on one side and then they are helping on another side, they, they, there's some kind of a conflict there, uh, the left hand and right hand. And I don't know who is winning. Is there more squeeze and is there less help or uh, is the balance the right one? And is there any way that the big companies can show how they're doing that? Uh, I, I think that's something that the big companies should be doing. In, so when you say low bar for the small companies, I think that's good, but the higher bar for companies like H&M and Apple, I think they should have more scrutiny on, on what they're actually doing. 
Correct, correct, correct. So I think, thank you very much for the question. I think that's uh, that's an excellent addition to, and these things are something I'm I'm thinking about all the time. So um, it's good if we can work together to find solutions. Now, now this comes a little bit to to the expert problem. So uh, one month ago, I mentioned this the context issue, um, where I've I've seen this many times when you have people in Shanghai, Beijing. Uh, Stockholm, Copenhagen, or wherever, and they are trying to understand, like you mentioned, Bangladesh, Philippines, China, people in those areas, do, do the experts really understand the challenges of the small business, the small business owner, the stress and the, the challenges they are going through, and also the people working in those organizations. So that's one issue, but uh, I also, I, I, I think that um, where the experts fail, and it, it's kind of a big problem because um, like in COVID, uh, the issues now is there's a lot of things that the experts don't know. Um, but it's sometimes it can be bad for your business to talk about the things you don't know. But I think to, to manage sustainability risks, we need to have that transparency about all the things we don't know as much as what uh, we do know. And this, this slide is just, because you have experts talking about probability that if we do this, we will achieve so-and-so regarding to climate change and so on. But the reality is we don't know. And the invisible hand that I have here is not, it's not an Adam Smith kind of economic invisible hand. It's a invisible hand related to, we just don't know how uh, our pollution is here interacting with the atmosphere, all the natural systems in forests and so on. There's, it's just too complicated. So we need to be much more careful in how we're predicting. And that careful needs to also uh, transfer back into maybe need to do even more in less pollution and so on. And maybe not only just focus on CO2. I think that's one issue. We seem to always focus on, on one problem and then forget a lot of other problems. This, this, this is from the Black Swan. So I mentioned Nassim Taleb. Um, he's, uh, he's an author that has uh, driven a lot of the way that I think about risks. And this is just to show um, the problems with models. So climate change, there's a lot of models. And this is a very simple system here. Um, but when you, if you consider that first bounce, if there's just a little bit of a difference, then when it hits the top wall, there's a larger difference. And then when it hits the back wall, the difference is already quite big. And this is a very simple model. And if you then consider um, modeling millions of factories, people driving around in cars, how is that impacting forests and atmosphere and so on? And then potentially melting uh, North Pole, South Pole ice. I think um, there's a lot of uncertainty there that I can understand that people don't want to talk about it because then they feel, oh, well, you don't even know if climate change is happening. Um, but I think that's, that's a problem. But then if you just say you try to make it more confident than it is, maybe that opens you up for criticism. Um, and I think, I think models can be used in a different way where you say, if this happens, if the water goes up two, three meters, I mean, and you don't talk about it as, as a firm prediction, but you say, this is a potential outcome. I think that's maybe a better way of communicating. Um, but uh, everyone needs to be educated on that. I think people also, people listening to experts prefer certainty and they don't like to listen to a lot of uncertainty. So I do understand that is a problem for experts, but I, I, it also causes a lot of problems. So again, what is the solution? <clears throat> so so this, is, this is something again with um, my experience because I've worked on both environmental assessments and environmental impact assessments. So what I want to describe here is, is the difference between the two. 
so environmental impact assessments are always focused on um, projects that have not started yet. So basically it's in the design and planning on the left side of the slide. So basically this is showing that you have this very nice area that's undeveloped and someone wants to come in and, and do some kind of a project. Uh, <clears throat> if you do environmental assessments like I do, um, risk assessments, you usually actually go and look at factories that are already there. So you see a lot of risk, you see wastewater, you see air emissions, you see groundwater pollution and so on. And you even do divesting. So when someone wants to get out of a factory, they also want to say, well, I want a snapshot to show this is what the situation is when I leave. So no one can come and say some other pollution was caused by me. And what, what I want to say is that if you only work on environmental impact assessments, I think there's a risk that you don't understand a lot of the problems that happen later on in projects. So I, I think you need experts to do both things. Experts need to work and look at factories. They need to work at projects that have been in operation for 20, 30 years, and then go back and look at new projects. Because otherwise there's a risk that you think that that report you wrote, because I, I mean, I, I can be honest and say, if I go back and look at a report I wrote 20 years ago and say, this is, <laughs> there's so many gaps here. Um, so I think that's, what is the feedback loop for experts? That's basically my question. And if that feedback loop is not working effectively, um, you have the problem of uh, ethics, but you also have a feedback loop. And you need to be sure that the consultants are actually learning from their mistakes if they're making them. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. So, so here, here is the, the slide I presented before about the balance between environment. So I, I remember the first time <laughs> uh, we talked, we mentioned this because you said the same issue is in India as in China, that if you close down all the factories with the problems, then you have a social problem because you don't have enough jobs. So it's very easy to have these modern facilities with not, enough, not a lot of people working there with uh, diverse um, employees and so on, but then you don't have enough jobs for the big population. So I think this is, this is something that um, all the countries with big populations are really challenging, uh, uh, exposed to this challenge and figuring out how how to solve the environmental issues, but then also keep people in work at the same time is, is something that we need to figure out what is the solution. And, and I think that's why coming back to your question about small, small companies, because small companies generally employ more people. Um, so the suppliers will have more employees. So I think supporting them and finding good sustainability solutions for them is much more important than corporations. They might globally have a lot of people, but if you spread that out to all the countries where they're actually active, it's, it's not that uh, significant. And this, this brings me to the sustainability, sustainable development goals. So this is something that um, when I did risk assessments, it was not something really that I was thinking about, but listening to the roundtable conferences, um, I started thinking about these. And I, I want to say first, I think these are very good for countries. So I think they're a very good idea for a country to say, this is what we need to focus on and we need to achieve these things. But where I have, <clears throat> where I'm more skeptical is if we take these 17 goals and then we give them to corporations and small businesses, I'm not sure this is the right model. And I'm kind of concerned that it causes more confusion. I mean, if we, if we take this to like what we mentioned, a small business, I mean, they're gonna be over, overwhelmed. Um, so, and of course, not all of these are relevant for them, but any company, I think, and if I go to this next slide, this is, uh, I was watching this on through LinkedIn. It was a UN web TV video. And 
what what is shown here on the left side is the connection of these 17 goals and it just looks like complete chaos to me <laughs> um, but i actually like the right side and i i think this is what small businesses need they need to they need the economy i mean they need to make a profit of course like you always say uh, Parish. Um, if you don't make money then there's nothing right um, <laughs> the company does not if the company yeah. does not survive sustainability has is, is also is also not going to survive so you need that and then you need the environment and the social side and i think having those three and then finding a balance for a small business within that there's complexity right and you can go in and say the social things then you can mention some of the things that are included in the 17 sustainability development goals but i think the presentation needs to be easier for them uh, rather than having these one my next slide i think this is kind of scary right the 169 targets 247 indicators um, the, your question about ethical consultants, right? I, I've written here a paradise for charlatan experts and consultants. And that's where I feel consultants can use this to make a lot of money, but is it really providing value for the clients? And is it just creating very complicated reports? So that's not what I want. Um, so without logic, more data leads to more chaos. Um, so, and, and this is my kind of, everyone talks about big data in, in the modern world. My, my, my concern about, we have more and more data, but is this data just focusing on certain areas and not covering other areas where a lot of the problems are? So, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> and the consumers, of course, I think this is, this is something that needs to also be handled. I, I, I don't, I don't see this being done really, in in a way that's transparent. Is, I mean, how is the product? For example, I, I think a lot of people buy a product like an electric car, for example, and they, if they make, if that product makes them feel, oh, I'm so sustainable now because I have an electric car and I don't drive something horrible with petrol and so on. And that means I can go on however many holidays and do whatever I want elsewhere, then I don't think it's working. So if, if, if one product is just giving consumers this green light to go off and be very unsustainable in other areas, um, then we're not achieving any kind of sustainability. So, so I think there's a lot more complexity there that I don't understand, but I, I think more investigation definitely needs to be done. This, I, don't, I don't know what this slide is, but uh, I mean, just this is kind of just the, missing the point. How's the president? He did some exercise and ate a salad. Sounds good. Oh, and someone might have put a cyanide pill in his salad. I mean, this, this is just the way I feel a little bit about sustainability sometimes. We report all these things that are great, but if we're missing something that is like the cyanide pill in the salad, I think, and, and it's a little bit like people when they look at health, right? They focus on calories, cholesterol, um, some indicators, but I think the body is more complex than that. It's, it's all related to how much exercise you do, the stress you have, the pollution you're exposed to and so on. And, you need to consider all of those things, um, how old you are and so on, uh, to figure out what is right for you and not have this kind of focus. Smartphones, I think smartphones are doing this to people, just focus on one or two indicators and then they think everything is bad or everything is good. And <clears throat> so to this, this is also something um, kind of inspired by these CASI conferences that I've been listening to. And so um, asymmetry, screwness, I think is something that I like to think about in risk. I mean, you can take, you can do a lot of things and get small gains, but then if that small gain is then exposing us to bigger risks, 
And of course, my question here is, for example, electric cars. I mean, are, are electric cars potentially, oops, I don't have that slide now. Um, are electric cars potentially that kind of risk where we are getting small gains from the electric cars, but the metals that are being mined in a lot of developing countries are actually causing a bigger risk that sometime in the future causes a breakdown of the natural system. And I think that's something we need to be very careful about. I mean, basically sustainability is this. Sustainability is this curve because we can keep on living the way we are, but at some stage it doesn't work anymore. And we don't know, <laughs> the thing is we don't really know when, when that day is. And that's kind of where we're playing with an unseen risk. Um, so, but this, this is of course, just looking at the negative side. So to also be positive, and this comes back to your question earlier on, small companies. And I think if we can, um, you mentioned supporting on the ESG side, but also investing in a lot of small companies. So I see this in two, two areas. I think you have the small companies serving bigger companies. So they are doing traditional services and providing some little part that is needed for cars, needed for smartphones, needed for windmills and so on. Um, but if we give them support, they could maybe develop new innovation that makes their operation more sustainable. And at the same time, you have other companies that are just focusing on sustainability. So those are developing some kind of a new technology that can help all the other companies. So you have lots of opportunity, I think, on the small side. Uh, if we look, think about natural system, the way nature approaches a problem. Nature doesn't have, okay, let's have 10 experts and then figure out how to grow this big forest. Nature just throws a lot of small things into the, into the mix and then just sees what works. And I think that's what we can, that's what actually markets do when they're working well. When you have a lot of small companies, a lot of them are failing, but a lot of them are succeeding. And the ones that are successful give us a lot. And that's a very um, strong and healthy economy. If you just have big corporations taking all the benefits, that's actually a very unnatural and uh, I would say, uh, well, the term used by Nassim Taleb is of course, uh, not a anti-fragile, it's a fragile system, easily broken. So yeah, <clears throat> that's basically uh, my presentation. So I've gone through critical to solve, not hide the expert problem the balances between all these environmental and social um, objectives. And of course then understanding and using complexity of what I just mentioned there to hopefully find um, sustainability solutions. So I hope it's not too too negative, but I think, I think there are things that are being done that are not really helpful. But at the same time, I think there's a lot of potential to solve the problems. And um, hopefully, hopefully it will happen. And I think, I think some of the benches that you are engaged in is very consistent with uh, the ideas that I've tried to present here. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much, Patrick, uh, for that excellent presentation. Um, and thank you very much for the praise. Um, you know, I'm very happy that uh, you like some of the efforts that we are doing. Um, yes, we try to, um, you know, we are, we are really trying very hard um, across 52 countries to reach out to as many corporates as possible and then help us reach out to as many citizens as possible. Um, you see, we started with education um, and now we are into volunteering. Now we are moving up and down the value chain. Um, so, yes, yes, we are trying a lot. Uh, but that was an excellent presentation, very concise and uh, 
more than the presentation i really liked that uh, you raised a couple of questions um you know and there are no answers to that really so um, as you said you don't have all the answers um i don't have all the answers and really nobody would have all the answers so uh, you know the top top question because we are working on an esg exchange we are um, uh, working on consulting last mile fulfillment we are trying to do so many things um so the question that i always think is should we lower the esg bar or should we raise it higher you know and uh, it works both ways so um, a simple answer uh, would be okay let's raise it higher you know let's make it stringent and the companies will follow and then we'll have a cleaner world uh, but it doesn't work like that uh, you can have all the clean companies in the world in a densely populated uh, country and then you won't have no jobs um, and if you don't have jobs then um, you can say goodbye to diversity and inclusion um and everything else within the sdgs so um, you know it is really a cash 22 situation uh, when you try to raise the bar on esg um again um, you know if you were to lower the bar um then the companies that are currently following esg would be happy and then um anyway we are fighting a losing battle on the climate front you know it is a losing battle till now um you know and um, if it is already a losing battle then what is the point in lowering the bar um so yes these are questions we don't have answers uh, but that is the purpose of uh, the cassie knowledge series uh, let's ask the right questions to the right people um, you know that 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 really helps i mean what one i mean just one way to try and answer that about lowering the bar i think one thing i kind of mentioned a little bit is you can you can keep the bar or even raise the bar for certain corporations um the big ones with high profitability but at the same time you can actually lower the bar for some of the smaller companies um to try and get them engaged i i think that's that's one one issue but also to with climate change losing the battle i i think i think what i also try to present here is that yes the bar is maybe so high but if you're not actually achieving it um so if you lower the bar and achieve it maybe you actually get a a positive impact by lowering the bar so this this possibly, is possibly. that's 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 the thing that i i'm always looking at so lowering the bar and then having a positive impact from that because this is something i actually worked with the chinese uh, government how many years ago it's like 16 17 years ago because china what they did very early on their environmental legislation very quickly became the same as in europe so they had the same requirements as in europe but their their industry was at a completely different level so you had this huge compliance gap um and what i was discussing with the chinese then is that uh, you need you need some stepping stones you need to be able to go down and say give these companies because if 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 the, if the gap is this big there's no way for them to achieve compliance so they just find ways to live in a non compliance world but if you give them something that's near to their current situation then everyone wants to comply you i think you mentioned this all companies want to uh do a good thing or a better thing if they can but if they can't they have no choice and no one is going to be a little bit more compliant if they can't be completely compliant it makes no sense the risk is the risk is the same for them they might get shut down tomorrow right so correct so that's that's my my argument for in some situations why lowering the bar might not have a negative impact could have positive impact correct i couldn't agree more i am absolutely in agreement with your um, argument um you know that brings us to the end of this seminar uh but we should definitely continue um, this discussion on one of the round table conferences at cassi um at a larger audience so that um, you know let's let's create some chaos um at one of the round table conferences uh, that that would really be fun yeah so one final question to you patrick uh, before we sign off um one of the um, you know articles that you have published uh which was very interesting um you know I, and i found it quirky and funny 
survivors are killing safety you know so it is it is self explanatory uh, but really i found it pretty funny you know survivors are killing safety and uh, you say that okay our prayers saved us so maybe we don't need an apparatus to survive um just just in the next two three lines uh, you know tell me what are your thoughts on this well well it's 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 basically i mean uh, because i was uh, early in my career i was a safety consultant right and uh, you would go go there and try to do safety training um and you would always have this guy who had been doing the wrong things for 20 years and nothing had happened to him right so Correct. and 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 that's the probability that's the problem with safety is that even if you do all the bad things it's not a certainty that you get injured or killed the risk is just higher right so the thing that i was trying to explain with this uh, this article was that if you have all these companies doing bad things you will have some of them who get through a five year period without anything bad happening and they will believe that there is no risk because the longer time goes they they believe that there is no risk right that's the right. way so it proves uh, it proves their theory you know that they were right all along in spite of being wrong because precedence uh, becomes a rule the rule is yeah. not the rule but the precedence becomes the rule and so if they've been doing wrong um, and getting away with it uh, then that becomes the rule exactly exactly and and the companies that do have accidents they are not included in that data right so so that's right. that's the problem it's it's a little bit related to the concept i presented here today about silent evidence right so you always have to think about when when a company says that they've had no accidents for 5 years you have to think about if you had 100 of those factories doing exactly the same thing as this one would they all 100 have no accidents and if the question is definitely no then you know that they are not doing the right thing so you know, that's that's that where this very difficult uh, mental concept to look at the numbers um just to see you know you can't just look at one factory by itself it might be a good factory it might be doing safety the right way but it might also just be a very lucky company correct correct, correct. no that that was some excellent advice and that was an amazing pre- presentation patrick uh, thank you very much for joining us today uh, as always it was an absolute pleasure talking to you thank you very much patrick likewise likewise thank you very much look forward to the next one ah yes absolutely absolutely mitesh <laughs>